afternoon. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Nicola Kemp and I'm Editorial Director of Creative Brief. For Bite Live 2020, in a year like no other, we are focused on the individuals, organizations and creative work really making a difference in our industry. And it's the power of creative work we're gonna talk about today, the winners of this year's prestigious Garrity Awards. The Garrity Awards was named for Francis Garrity, the copywriter who coined the slogan, a diamond is forever. It is unique in the market because it judges the best advertising through the female lens, successfully redefining the standard to which advertising is held. All female juries from across the globe come together to define, debate and deliberate creative brilliance. Now, I don't need to tell anyone that the coronavirus crisis is disproportionately impacting women's careers. Research from McKinsey and Lean In shows that one in four women are considering downshifting their careers or leaving the workplace entirely because of the impact of this crisis. This is why we are so grateful to host our second event with the Garrity Awards and learn some much needed marketing lessons from the female lens. And with that in mind, we have some brilliant marketers with us today, all of whom judge the Garrity Awards to lift the lid on the best work and how we successfully change the narrative for women in our industry. Danielle Bebus is Vice President of Marketing at Avon Brazil, having previously been at Procter & Gamble. She has won multiple Effie Awards, several Can Lions, and is a member of the Executive Board of Directors for CENP, the board that regulates agency remuneration and best practices. She is also on the board of directors of the Brazilian Advertising Association. Abigail Kuma is Chief Marketing Officer at Debenhams. Having spent 24 years at British Airways, Abigail is behind some of the best truly brand defining work for the airline, including, and I really, I must admit, I loved thinking back to this, the Don't Fly Support Team GB campaign, um, arguably one of the best sponsorship campaigns in the history of marketing. And since leaving BA, she has used her incredible experience in marketing and customer experiences to help businesses develop turnaround plans, to develop excellence in customer experience and commercial awareness to, to drive growth. She is a fellow of the Marketing Society and an alumni of the Marketing Academy Fellowship. And last but no means least, we have Dr. Rebecca Swift, and she is at the forefront of researching and analyzing trends in visual communications. And she leads the creative and research and planning team at Getty Images. Rebecca is passionate about evolving the representation of all people in visual communications. And through her role in the Show Us program with Dove, she is actively bringing more female photographers into the industry to successfully move the dial when it comes to representation. So thank you all so much for joining us today. So an opening question. I mean, 2020 has been a year like no other, and we all need some positivity. So to kick off, I'd like to ask everyone to share their biggest highlights of the Garrity Awards judging process. What was the key learning you took away from the process and from such a diverse range of winners? And Rebecca, if I could start with you. Sure, I, I for me, actually, the, what I enjoyed most was looking at ads that had come from countries where I don't spend a lot of time looking at their advertising. So I loved the, um, the agency of the year from Thailand. I loved all of that work. It's so visually different to anything else we looked at. Um, just because of my own bias, I spent a lot of time going through who had produced all of the entries. So I looked at the gender balance of, of who, who worked on, on the different campaigns and, and spent a lot of time <laughs> looking at that. And, and I, I, I felt that there was some really positive shifts um, that were happening there. Um, so that, that filled me with hope and um, yeah, positivity for the future. Oh, you would think at this stage, how many months <laughs> in, I would I know, yeah. myself. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I, just, 
yeah. so sorry I was on mute so yeah. my <laughs> from the female lens I have still not learned how to unmute <laughs> but Abigail could I ask you the same question yeah sure for me I think it was I, I, I love the breadth of work, but I think the thing I really enjoyed most, and it, and it came out in some of the winners, were the things that weren't seen as just traditional or just multi-channel campaigns. They were small, they were incredibly focused on what they, um, what they were, the messages they were trying to get across. And, and the one that was an absolute standout for me was um, in India, and it was the punishing signal. And um, I just absolutely loved the fact that they had got into the fact that, that you would remember it because it would actually teach you something along the way. And then some of the really small kind of pop up ideas that were so incredibly focused, they became so much more memorable than just, you know, just a classic ad spot or something that you might just try and shut down if you were looking at it as a pre roll um, on, on digital. So yeah, ver variety and actually the small but really, really impactful stuff that stays with you. That's great. And I could see Danielle nodding along vigorously at your at your highlights there. Um, and, you know, that's what we need to do. Yeah. To sell something. Punishing signal was one one of the one of the cases that I really really loved because I thought it was so unique, a really service to society, you know. But uh, so I think for me, um, I think two things stood out. I think one was a lot of purpose driven, you know, you can call it work for good, but service to society messages. Oh my God, there were so many, so many from. And, and sometimes embedded in product and sometimes not. Even the hair line, I think it was in Iran. Mm. Iran, if I'm not wrong, right? How do you advertise yeah. hair care, hair products in a market where you can't show your hair? No, so, I mean, fr from that to the punishing signal to, you know, the Armenian uh, girl's name, th there were so many cases of, I think raising flags, debating subjects that society needs to debate and needs to talk about. I think this was one of the things that stood out for me. And the second one that I thought was really nice to see was, I think Rebecca talked about this, was the non-traditional, not, not, I think uh, Rebecca or Abigail, not, not necessarily a marketing campaign, but some were products in itself, right? Very related to design. Mm. And for me, the winner of the year was Soap with a Lump. I thought mm. it was absolutely brilliant, you know, very connected to a women's problem, a women's point of view. And in a way, such a simple thing, but it's mm. often the simple, obvious ideas who are the most complicated for you to get to, no? It's, it's I love the, the the power of simplicity sometimes to really like communicate powerfully such a complex message. And Danielle, you mentioned um, the, the advertising for good category. And, and I, it seems like it's bigger than a category in the industry. Like the, the, the conversation about purpose has become um, much more tangible um, in the midst of this crisis. Um, and I just wanted to read a quote from one of your fellow judges, um, the um, fantastic copywriter, Vicky Ross. Um, and she said, advertising for good was a common theme. This often makes people groan, usually because the for good bit is a bit of an afterthought or opportunistic, but a lot of the entries did this so well. I now believe advertising really could help change the world. The reason for this common theme. So in the midst of this crisis, um, many brands are redefining what purpose means um, from everything from pivoting the products they create to how they're getting them to consumers. Um, what were the key shifts that you saw within the advertising for good category and how do you think that's going to continue to elevate the industry in 2021? Um, Rebecca, could I start with you, please? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I had to go back to to um to the the good um cup because i got so tired of violin and piano music and and the same voiceover in each one that i started to become very cynical 
and started questioning why why these you know why the the entries were made and so I, I kind of went back to them later when I was <laughs> less frazzled by it all um and I and, and I thought it was really interesting how again uh, and this I think this goes back to to what the other two ladies have said in terms of the diversity of societal issues that that the, that were being addressed you know the honking the breast cancer um i'm trying to think what else was in there was, was in there um the uh the, the holocaust i think was that that was a societal one as well you know um telling stories um the the um the black supermarket i think that was that was another one um so i thought it was quite interesting how brands especially were looking to see what they could do beyond sell product which is a trend we've obviously been seeing in recent years anyway you know um and certainly all the research i've read is that you know consumers seem to believe that brands have the most um work to do in terms of you know doing doing um doing good for society um and you know and it's been really interesting uh, going through this kind of covid period of the last seven months how questions around sustainability and brands and questions around in the inclusivity, which is obviously something I'm very interested in and, and um, uh, you know, what diversity and inclusion looks like in advertising has just exploded in terms of those, those conversations. And you can see that in these entries. Um, and so I've got a lot of, again, I feel quite optimistic for next year because I feel that the conversations we're having now will pay dividends next year. Uh, in terms of what is created in the next 12 months. Thank you. And, and Abigail, do you share that optimism that Rebecca's got there? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, a, I'm a thoroughly optimistic person, so I'll share optimism whenever it, any, any yeah. opportunity. I, I think <laughs> for me on the um, kind of advertising for good is that there were lots of great campaigns that we saw that were around societal issues such as child trafficking, um, for example, but that's the nature of the campaign. The campaign is about that thing and you should do good. There's a difference between that and those being fabulous campaigns and then others, so the supermarket example where they were going, hang on, hey spooky person, that's good. My <laughs> um, intern. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think the, um, I think the challenge for people doing advertising for good is to remember what the purpose of them putting the campaign into the market is for and that is to change behavior to either buy a product from that company or change a perception so they feel better about a company and they feel a more emotional connection with it so if you feel like a supermarket is willing to you know, put themselves out there in order to bring in products to support local farmers, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, they're selling vegetables. That's fine. But if they're saying something that is just jumping on a bandwagon of, you know, a kind of the, the flavor of the month, then that's got nothing to do with their core true values as a company for their colleagues, for their customers, or to drive forward their commercial benefit. Then I think you've got to be quite careful. So yeah, I, I think they do fall into lots of different camps. If there's any way somebody can do good, even inside a company or through their campaign, whilst sticking to not only their core values but their commercial needs, then I, I think that's where that's where it's a really, really winning combination. That's such a good point, and particularly in this market, that commercial need element is is can be quite all encompassing. Um, with so many companies that are just kind of putting everything into just keeping going to some degree. Um, and Danielle, I'd love to get your builds on that. I mean, what's your view of, of where the industry is going when it comes to purpose? Because we've had a lot of really good points around the need to, to root it really in the, in, the, in the truth of the brand. Yeah, I think uh, the brands that are doing it well today are the brands that have or the companies that have a purpose that is very closely connected to what you do and the business that you're in, right? I mean, I think some years ago, companies would think about a purpose almost as a, this is almost like the nonprofit arm of the, of the corporation. And, and it's not that anymore, right? It's within my business, my business model, the consumers that I reach, the, the category that I play in, what can I do to make society better, to 
to get the world to be a better place for everybody. And I think this is where purpose becomes so much more relevant, right? Because it has to be connected to your business. So in, in that sense, um, I think we're going to see a lot of that next year, no? And how the companies reacted to what happened this year and how each and every one of them talked in a different way or tried to connect in a different way. What can I bring to the world? I, I think from, from the entries this year, the one that calls to that comes to my head is is the Coke campaign in South Africa. No, the 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 story of their putting people's names in in their in their tins, no, all over the world. It was like a a really nice you know marketing activation, but then all of a sudden in South Africa with all of the dialects there, you're actually generating a lot of empathy and almost providing a service to the local community on how do you spell and how do you actually say my name in my dialect i thought it was such a well thought out well connected you know execution and and a great show of coke to i have a global strategy but how do i understand the local culture which i think is the big challenge that all the global brands have yeah giving it something for the local market that may have actually turned it to a negative when they couldn't put names or they couldn't put everybody's names and be inclusive of all of their consumer base and turning that around from them for them, I, I think was really nice insight and a real flip of a coin that could have actually been very negative for them otherwise. And that's an, another example of a campaign that's a real sort of driver of commercial outcomes as well as, as, well as cultural outcomes. Um, so I wanted to shift it slightly. Um, we can't to have a conversation about an awards show without talking about a bit of controversy, a bit of risk taking, and a campaign that seems to be quite marmite um, amongst a lot of marketers and consumers alike, the, um, the Moldy Whopper, um, which obviously was a, a, a big winner at the Garrity Awards. Um, but marketing spend has been hit hard by the current crisis, um, yet marketing and creativity are such key commercial drivers. Um, and what did you think um, was the key in terms of the awards entries about showing how creativity can drive a business forward? I mean, do we still need to be having this conversation? It feels like we probably do because we look at the figures and we see that marketing spend has obviously decreased um, as a lot of other um, discretionary spend has. Um, so Rebecca, what's your, what's your take on that? Um. I'm not a marketer, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it from a creative point of view rather than from a marketing point of view. And I think, I think it's the same when you look across the, 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 the history of, you know, fabulous advertising. There's always something irreverent and contrary about the, the campaigns that do really, really well. They have taken the tropes of that vertical or, or, or that style of advertising and just flipped it. And I think that's what's what, you know, the mouldy whopper has done that. Now, I, I, you know, I have my own feelings about the, the whole kind of Burger King kind of marketing ecosystem. It, you know, it, it doesn't appeal to me as a consumer, but the aesthetic way that they created this ad and that film, again, it really annoys me that that piece of music has been used in so many ads. But I, again, I'll, I'll, I'll put that to one side, but I love the visual but, I mean, it's it's so stunningly shot, even though it's gross. Um, mm. That you know, when you when you when you're when you're given something that is is committed to the idea, so you know, into it, so far down <laughs> down the road, it's not it's not tokenistic in any way. It's it's you know, we're going to put the best filmmakers and the best photographers behind this, and, and and make it look as beautiful as possible, whilst also showing that it's not beautiful. I thought that was that was actually very very clever and also very very creative. Um, and likewise, you know, some some of the other campaigns, the uh, the Lacoste crocodile campaign, is just it's just a stunning kind of Inception style piece of film. But actually, the story was pretty good. I thought. I'm not entirely sure how it connects to wearing Lacoste polo shirts, but um, I I felt that that was that was a you know a nice creative piece. But I but as I say, I really. I really love the work that really connects to really selling, but very, very commercial selling a project product uh, and done in such a way that kind of makes you think 
um, in a way that you haven't, you know, about a product. I mean, basically what they're saying with Burger King is you will feel less bad eating a Burger King versus any of the competitors. They're not trying to make, make you think that it's a health product. They're just trying to make you, you know, um, understand that you can, you, you're eating something with less preservatives in it, which, it all, you know. It's, it's so it's fascinating. Bit- You've built such an interesting brand ecosystem uh, mm. and it, and it ignites a lot of conversations as yeah. well, which is which is not always polarizing. Actually, it's it's, it's something that you know. I, I hate that phrase, regular people, but people that aren't in marketing <laughs> will have a conversation about. Um, <laughs> Abigail, what was your what was your view of the role of you know creativity and also you know just in the lens of the current situation we find ourselves in? You know, is it is it harder as a marketer to take creative risk in this ecosystem or on the flip side do you kind of need it more well you know I think you can I'm not going to give you a straight answer because you can play it both ways and I really think it depends what business you're in so take the example of the moldy whopper um you know you would absolutely you know whilst it's grotesque to look at it's core to the values of the natural products they they're not trying to hide behind the fact that you know if you eat burgers every day it's probably not a great balanced diet they're owning it it's incredibly honest and to support Rebecca's view you know what they went all in and shot it beautifully so they they put their money where their mouth is you know they got behind the idea of rocking the boat and you know I I couldn't say that I saw it a lot as a consumer, but I know about it. So it just exploded in terms of the PR value of the the risk um, that was around it. Now, you know, when when we were introducing, you mentioned something that I did eight years ago now that was incredibly um, risky, which is put money behind a campaign that said, please don't buy this product, please get behind your country. And I felt that we could do that as a flag carrier at the time. That was a long time ago. And people still touch on that campaign. And it had a fraction of the money of big, you know, like McDonald's, Visa, P&G at the time in and around the Olympics. So I think if it's core to your values as an organisation, our products are made of natural things. You know, we are the flag carrier of the nation. You know, we stand for women's health, um, whatever it is in your category. Then I think you can do it. I think it goes a little bit back to my point on um, advertising for good. Don't jump on a bandwagon and do something risky because that's the risky thing everybody's talking about right now. Do something that's really risky if you're willing to stand up for it and whatever way the zeitgeist goes in years to come, you have, it's pretty much going to still stand true to your brand. You know, in years to come, the flag carrier of the nation or in Great Britain will be British Airways in years to come. You know, they will be criticized greatly if they put a ton of preservatives into a product that they have said is natural. Dove, you know, if they don't stand for real women. So as long as you're happy that you can stand for the core of the thing that's at the controversy, at the centre of the controversy, then I'd say do it because it just buys you such talkability. It, you know, that is critical to the success of it, and it buys you coverage that you'll never be able to afford otherwise. Yeah, that's such a good point as well about it not being kind of like a one-hit wonder to some degree. It's got to have that um, longevity, um, and. Danielle, I'd love to get your view. What, what do you feel in terms of the ability to take creative risks and what the judging process taught you ab- about that and, and any kind of learnings that, that you had around that? I think, I think the Burger King, King team did a superb job here. And I think it's a great example of a brand that was incredibly courageous right, to defy all of the norms of the category of how do you show appetite appeal, you know, in, in food. And, and, but again, single-minded, you know, add what is the one benefit that they wanted to communicate. It's very linked to their point of differentiation, you know, long-term, what do I want people to think about the Burger King versus, you know, their direct competitors, what needs to stand out? So it was so strategic, you know, for them and and never done before. So I think today, 
it is so important for all of the marketers, right? And, and the ecosystem around us to think about the, the PR ability and the virability and the earned media potential of any campaign, because if you don't generate that, you know, I mean, nobody has the, the media dollars that we used to have 10 years ago, right? To buy every single media spot in the world needed. So for your message to really explode globally, you need that to become a conversation, you no? Know? And to become a conversation, you need to have a point of view. You know, we, we always say at Avon that, you know, the nobody talks about the vanilla ice cream, right? I mean, vanilla ice cream, everybody eats it, nobody loves it, nobody hates it. It's not a topic of conversation. So you can't expect, right, people to be talking about something that, that will please everybody. And I think this is the courage and that marketers and our agencies and our partners, you know, need to put together and, and have so that our brands are being talked about. That's such a good point about having a point of view as well. And I'm going to shift the debate slightly and I'm going to ask you all to have a point of view on, on the impact uh, that coronavirus crisis is having on women's creative careers because the Garrity Awards is unique in the way that it's judged through a female lens. And we know over 80% of purchasing decisions are made by women yet only 12 to 13% of creative directors are currently women. So first, um, really, uh, as marketers and, and as people that have an impact on the creative landscape we find ourselves in, um, how aware of you are you of that disconnect? And what do you think is the importance of the female lens in, in driving the best commercial outcomes for your business? Um, and I'd, I'd like to start with Rebecca, because obviously you've done so much in sort of shifting the lens when it comes to the visual representation of women and girls. Like, what do you see as the commercial imperative to do that? Damn it, I was on mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the, I mean, the, the commercial imperative, I think, for, for, for brands is that we are getting closer and closer to consumers demanding to know who is behind the lens, whether that's in, in, in photography, in filmmaking, in uh, ad creation. There is way more interest in who who is who is responsible, who's who's making the decisions, um, and what does the team look like? Um, and 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 I see that more and more um, with with the the research we've done with with younger consumers, especially, and and um, and so you've got to kind of future proof your business. I think um, it's it's you know it's it's a, it's almost like a um, acknowledged truth that you know most of the creative directors are male most of the the the, the creative directors even in the ads that were put into the garrities are male um men are in the in the in those positions so how do you make that shift well you have to nurture and you have to bring women up behind and you have to you have to understand that women either bring a different view and you know the the the, the Lux uh, campaign um, that uh, that Abigail mentioned that was you know that's a that was a female crew and you could kind of feel you know I don't like the idea of female crews working on products that are specifically for women I think there should be there should be a you know inclusivity across the board but you can kind of feel that how that touches in a different way to to, to some of the other stuff that we looked at so. There's a couple of things that I think are really, really important. You've got to have you've got to have a, a nurturing program in order to, to to bring women up, and you have to be very, very. Um, uh, you you have to um, be be very, very kind of uh, what's the word? I'm trying to think. It's too late in the day. Um, purposeful. That's the word. You have to be really purposeful about who you put in those positions in in those moments when you're creating this this work. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about creating opportunities. It's about um, ensuring that you know the the, the cohort that comes behind can see 
can see that and you can see it in advertising now you know i've i've been in the industry for for 20 plus years and when i came in all of the you know the people that we looked up to the the amazing creative directors and and you know the the the, the, the men essentially who were creating the amazing advertising at the time that's created a a a, a community of of a certain kind of person underneath it so mm. you know we need to get these in these these uh these names and uh especially you know people from different backgrounds um who are in these positions already get them out and and expose them to the world so that, that so that it it seems like a um it seems like something that, that that you can go into as a as a young woman or you know someone from a from a different background did i ask the question i think i did yeah yeah it is. and and Abigail, I'd love to bring you in here because Rebecca's just made some really great points about elevating a more diverse range of talent and being purposeful in doing that. And particularly in the current climate where it just feels like every day we get another data point or we're not getting a data point. Um, so in the UK, for example, gender pay gap reporting is on, on pause currently. I mean, women's careers are not, but some of these decisions being made and the data points coming in suggest that maybe we're not being purposeful enough when it comes to moving the dial, when it comes to ensuring that we get more equal representation behind the lens, which we then see in, a, in the work. What, what's your view on that? Like, how do we get there faster, get men involved? In I, I think, um, oh, the, the get men involved one is a, is a good piece to come back to, but just something I thought of um, whilst Rebecca was talking, that I think for me has absolutely come about due, um, because of COVID is um, the acceleration of everybody's um, not digital agenda just to the customer, but internal digital agenda of all having meetings like this as an example. So we would have had creative process in the week where everybody would have stood in a room, looked at things that were stuck on the wall, any change would have been written on it, taken back out into the office, you know, two layers down the organization, somebody would have artworked it back and 48 hours later you might have seen it. Now, you know, all of those people are on a Teams chat and they're putting the amends as we're talking into the chat bar and we're thumbs upping it and it's and it's getting signed off. Not only is that better for the business and it's making us more agile, but the people doing that are generally um, younger, more junior designers in that example in their career and they're getting exposed to the commercial conversation around a business and then changing the work because of it in order to get the right commercial mm -hmm. and customer response to that. In the past, it would have been, can you change the font size on that? Can you change this word to that? Can you move this to there? And it would have been very tactical. Now they can see the context of that. So I think the learning opportunity for people has been that the organizational mix for, for me has been flattened so much because everybody comes to the meeting because we've all got skin in that game. We all do it in the moment. An hour and a half later, it's all finished. Something that would have taken two days or wouldn't have bounced out to an agency before now we're doing in-house. For me, that's given great opportunity and broad breadth of sight across an organizations which has made people go oh well, I, I can see that now and I'd quite like to go and work over there and they would never have had that opportunity without having to sit down with their manager and talk about shadowing somebody and have it on the personal development plan previously so I think that's quite um critical um I, I think in terms of the role that men have to play I think, you know, you get you get great guys um, and I know that a lot of them are called out. I, you know, I would cite Richard Robinson, who's a, you know, key act, kind of activist in this. And he's always kind of like dad of girls is always the way he presents himself. Um, but, you know, they're very special people and they shouldn't be special. They should be the norm. But I think that we have to call it out. We have to go, actually, there's too many men looking at this. I want a, a woman to look at this. I want diversity in that. Um, and also when we talk about the people who buy our product, you know, you often think of the person who consumes it, not the person who buys it. And I really would challenge people to think about when they're briefing something, who is the purchaser of the item as opposed to the consumer of the item? Um, you know, you don't target 
kids things at kids you target it at their parents okay there's a bit of pester power behind that I'm sure but you know that something for a child's been bought by a parent you know would you say that a you know, men's sweater is probably being bought by um, so I think, you know, you need to understand your purchaser and your consumer and make sure that you're talking to them in the right kind of balance and measure as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's multifaceted. But I think, you know, whilst men play a part, they won't play a part unless they think they're welcome to the party because they're not the talkers. We are. So we have to invite them with open arms to be the people to take part in this conversation. I think that's such a good point and invite them to share the mental load of uh, pushing for progress on some of these issues and and, and, listen, and also yeah and, and be be open to hearing their point of view because they won't don't want to feel diminished in their masculine perspective either um, and that's quite an important thing to remember that in overcoming this you can't just make them feel small and insignificant they are an equal party to the conversation to make things move forward and if you don't include them you'll do nothing but alienate them that's a really good point and and I think it draws on um the point Rebecca was making earlier about being purposeful about mm. being about bringing men into this conversation as well. Um, and Danielle, I'd love to get your view, um, and particularly, you know, as someone who works for a at Avon um, and, and your background, what, what's your view on the impact of this crisis on women and also the, the female lens that perhaps isn't there sometimes behind the, the lens of the work being created, and if that's something that you see sometimes as a marketer? Yeah, I think overall, you know, all the numbers that we've seen globally, it's it's very sad for women, right? Women lost their jobs a lot more than men during the pandemic, you know, on and then when families got home and had to deal with kids school at home and homeschooling and all of that, most often than not, it's the women that are having to cook for the family, clean the home for the family, help the children with, with all of their homework and work as well, right? So the double, triple shift that we always do, I think, uh, I think in some senses, you know, the, it helped the men realize how much work it is when you know for you to do all of that at a home but it's been it's been particularly harsh and difficult for women i think in in situations like this you know initiatives initiatives like the free the bid you know we are great supporters of free the bid you know making sure that in all the creative processes we're going to have you know, uh, lens from a women's point of view, creative directors or directors for the films, right, that bring the female perspective, because, you know, as you said, 80% of the purchase decisions are made by women, right? Uh, we've, we've got data on this uh, in all the products, you know, all the consumer goods, uh, durable and non-durable categories. So I think uh, it's, it's important to, to look at that. I mean, one of the interesting things that I think the pandemic brought was, was the sacred cow in agencies related to, to uh, working from home. Right. I mean, the creative departments, you know, usually did not do that. Right. I mean, you mm -hmm. saw very seldomly agencies doing working from home. No, a majority of agencies, the work had to happen at the agency, no, and uh, it was very hard for you to do virtual, you know, work. And I think with the pandemic, and not only at agencies, I think a lot of businesses in general, no, that thought that when people work from home, they don't, they go to the beach, you know, or they stop working at noon. Um, <laughs> and I think this, this... How nice that would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it broke a lot of these sacred cows that you can't accomplish work and you can't do things virtually. You know, the president of one of the largest banks here in Brazil, he, he gave an interview, I think, in the beginning of the pandemic in April. And he was talking about how, you know, they had an agile team that came to him in the end of last year. And it was like an innovation team and they wanted to do something very different. And he did not approve. It was a group of 300 people that would work from home, I think, three days a week, you know, all virtual connections with people sitting all over the country and he said no I don't believe in that I don't like that you know I will never do that and then you know fast forward four months 
He said, I am, you know, working from home with my executive leadership team and I don't have 300 employees. I have now 50,000, you know, all working from home. So I think the work from home, you know, sacred cow was completely shattered. And I think it brought a, a new era of, of work environment for the agencies, which I think is very positive from a women's point of view, because it was particularly mm -hmm. difficult for women, you know, in the agencies to get to the leadership level and partially because of this, the working hours and it has to be at the agency. You can't do some work from home. No, at least that's what I saw as a client. No. I think yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a great point as well. Mm. Because, um, definitely it feels like the playing field is changing and that we do have this once in a generation opportunity to reset the workplace because these these changes it won't be possible to say it's not possible because you know we know we know that it is and um and with that in mind um in this highly challenging marketplace and very fast moving um there's an argument that sometimes maybe we've got rid of presenteeism in the office and replaced it with digital presenteeism, um, which <laughs> I think is ironic saying that on a Zoom call. But <laughs> <laughs> so I really wanted to ask you, you've shared so much insight from judging the awards, but if you could leave our audience with one takeaway that they could take to their virtual desks, or I know some people are going to the, into the office a little bit at the moment, um, what would that be like what what is key to staying creative staying sane um in this in this climate and and rebecca i, I was going to kick off with you if that's okay sure i mean i, I i'm i'm going to give you my view from from a, from a very personal point of view in that i i remain creative from looking at visuals so i get a lot of my nourishment from looking at visuals and the problem with being on the computer all the time now is that you're not going to spend your time looking at more visuals on on online which was probably a uh, um a habit i think that a lot of creatives got into you know doing google searches looking at instagram looking at uh, pinterest and you know so on and so forth watching youtube videos that's a classic um now you have to now you have to look elsewhere. So, you know, supporting galleries that are finally reopening, supporting shows that are, that are, that are now starting to be, you know, to, to be put on again, going to the cinema if there's still some cinemas on, and, you know, and supporting, for me, it's very much about supporting the creative community, um, but also getting some nourishment from that. I don't need to be in an office surrounded by other creatives, but I do need to be surrounded by people who are making making stuff and creating stuff um and and that really kind of helps me um then kind of come back to my desk sitting in the same spot <laughs> for another eight hours <laughs> and as you can see i keep i keep lots of visuals around me very diverse visuals to try and inspire me even when i'm looking at the camera stop me looking at myself and uh, look at the pictures yeah guys <laughs> and danielle I ask you the same question what 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 are you doing to to stay creative and and keep sane I think my message no I think that I got from from the awards this year and then I'll talk about what I'm doing but uh, I think the message to the people in the industry is bravery no we need to be brave uh, we need to be brave because the noise and the amount of messages that we get bombarded on is is every year you know so much bigger than the year before so if you really want to stand out in this climate you need to come up with something that is really arresting that is really different that will really stop people right and get them to look and pay attention to you now um and i i, I agree with rebecca i think you know this routine that we're on right now, 10, 12 hours a day in front of a screen, it's absolutely brutal. No, my glasses, you know, they went up, you know, like I have a higher degree now than I had in the beginning of the year. I have to change all my reading glasses. You know, it's it's hard, but I think, yeah, you keep looking, looking elsewhere and what people are doing and trying to find the time to look outside, you know, to look outside the window. Thank you. That's great advice. And and last but not least, Abigail, what would yours advice be? 
Oh my God. I mean, I, I, I thought of this. I've had the time to think, of course, coming third out of this. And, um, and mine is, I suppose, similar yet different. It, it, for me, it boils down to two words, um, culture and nature. I would say culture because the culture of your organization is the thing that will give you a strong foundation to believe that anything is possible, to believe that your voice can be heard, to believe that you can say, no, I can't do that meeting because that's when I need to give my kids lunch. I can't do that meeting then because, you know what, that's the time I take the dog out for a walk to get myself out. Um, and only a culture of an organization that has genuinely believed that the barrier of not having to be in the office has been broken is the now normal, not the new normal, the now normal. And I think the other one would be nature, because if I look to where I get, um, I love the word nourishment there that you, you came up, so you said, Rebecca, you know, I, I just can't believe how much of that I get from nature. And I think that if you look to nature, you will get inspiration from it, you will get calmness from it, um, you will get energy from it, um, and sometimes you'll get thoroughly soaked, but you know what, then only then can you really benefit from coming in and getting dry and being warm and feeling like you're nourished for the home you have. So I think nature has an awful lot. And the 10, 12 hours that we do sit in front of the screen, I think only we can own the fact that we allow ourselves to do that. And if the culture of the organization is right, you can call it out and say, no, I need to go out and I need to spend some time in nature because otherwise the working environment you have created is going to become a new version of a prison, which is what the weekly commute used to be. And all we're doing is changing the scenery, but not actually changing the effect. Um, without owning it and culture will take us there. Thank you so much. I think that's such a powerful point to end on. Um, thank you all for taking the time out to talk to us as part of Bite Live um, and to give us so many things to think about. Um, I'll definitely um, be taking the time to spend a bit more time with nature nourishment um, from the visual arts um, and also going to the cinema. I just want to go to the cinema. <laughs> um, so thank you all so much um, for giving us um, your time and your insight into this year's Garrity Award winners. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, thank you all. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.